no problem whatsoever. Okay, so instead of kind of uh, having only lists going on, kind of coming, I think I'll make full uh, lecture notes on the frontal. And you see the colors. Can mm -hmm. you explain them? It's like this, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not everything for a reason. <laughs> so today we will start from the start in the book and we move along. It's, it's kind of thin, but it has uh, a lot of content. So you need to really check that. Uh, in the first chapter, uh, there is something we already have discussed, basically. Uh, we talk a little bit about this concept of qualitative and quantitative emergencies, which we perhaps did not go into. Uh, quantitative logistics is kind of mathematical modeling logistics. Qualitative logistics is non-mathematical. So it's kind of more like, you know, production philosophy. Should we produce for order or should we keep inventory? Or kind of a lot of more arguments, discussions, definitions, this kind of stuff. More like, should we say, organizational view on logistics. Very important, of course, but kind of not my topic, and typically not this institution's topic. We have kind of specialized more in the quantitative sense here. Even though we have some people who works on the other side. As you probably know, there's a kind of deep mistrust between these two groups of people. Those who kind of favor mathematics and those who don't. Those who like mathematics, they believe that those who don't like it, don't like it because they don't understand it. While those who don't like mathematics believe that mathematics is silly. It's never used in practice anyway, so why should we deal with it? So there's a kind of a conflict here. We can kind of the formal way of doing things with the language of mathematics, or this different approach, which is kind of more traditionally social science way of thinking. So you should be aware of these kind of frontiers. I am strongly into the quantitative part myself, but there are others here. This is, uh, yeah, maybe I shouldn't mention names, but there are others here. They're different. You you had a short visit by Harald. He's kind of somewhat in between, I would say. Yes. Uh, he doesn't. He uses mathematical methods, methods when it's appropriate, and if it's not, he doesn't. Maybe that's how it should be. It seems sensible. Uh, we discussed briefly this concept, uh, this classical argument, why logistics is assumed to be more important as we move along. And there's two keywords here. It's the globalization keyword and the polit politics keyword. And it kind of both is related to competition. Uh, we kind of have, we have observed, haven't we, that this um, information costs are going down, the internet is available, we can buy goods from everywhere for a very relatively cheap cost as opposed to previous <coughs> years. Uh, transportation costs are going down. <coughs> All this kind of opens up for a kind of globalized world where everybody can compete with each other. Because this has implications on competition in general. Keeping a local monopoly is much harder if you kind of are, if the whole world is your, your competitor. So this is a kind of stream which kind of takes, no, sorry, increases competition. Leads to more competitive, less, less monopolies. In addition, there is a kind of political spirit here, and you know this. Uh, World trade organizations, the European Union, everybody's kind of <coughs> focused on kind of building down these barriers for competition. So these two forces together kind of drives in, into a, a world where we, where we see very high competitive markets. And if you have very high competitive markets, both on kind of products, IDs, information, then it's very hard to kind of keep your ideas it, unless you have a very strong patent system. So in the future, there is a question, of course, what will happen with this patent system, but it's, it has turned into some kind of ridiculousness, hasn't it? Uh, I saw the other day that Apple was trying to take patent on their MacBook Air view. Okay? They're trying to say, we came up with this idea 
our laptop, which should be this large, very thin on one edge, not so thin on the other edge. Of course, you can't patent that. Okay, patent is something for an ID which is which is which is new. Okay, this is not a new idea. Is it? Of course, Apple will say this, but I will not say so. So, if you kind of get these kind of patents, then the economy won't work because then nobody can produce anything. You have to kind of check if, if somebody has a patent and then everything breaks up. So I will not expect that these patent systems we have today can live on. On the other hand, and in addition, patents are kind of localized to region. So uh, if something is patented in the United States, it's not necessarily patented in China. Okay? So it's legal to copy it there. And of course, then everything breaks down again. So you, you, you should kind of expect that making money on ideas becomes more difficult because they are easier to copy. You get the information on how to copy them through the net or whatever. And it's very hard to see that it's kind of illegal to do it. At least that you have a kind of legal system that works. And in that sense, it, it kind of the only thing you can compete on basically is your logistics. Okay? How you produce things, your efficiency inside your organization. That one you can keep. Okay? That is kind of the only remaining monopolies. And of course, then logistics becomes very important. Okay? Because that's kind of what you compete on. Logistics is your competitive environment. If you do that good, then you live. <coughs> if you do that bad, then you die. So this is an argument why traditional manufacturing systems uh, should kind of emphasize logistics more. So it's kind of a, a classical logi lo uh, argument from people who do logistics. So, but they, they want to they say, okay, logistics is important. This is an argument. Now and of course more in the future. So what about the events? Events are perhaps local monopolies, and it will remain local monopolies. So events are kind of a situation where you can kind of think more traditional, I think. You can kind of keep, without patents, you don't need to take patents on rolling stones. Rolling stones are rolling stones. You, you can, of course, copy them, but you won't make money on the copy, as opposed to a very well copied car, which you can make money. But the point is that people buy rolling stones, records, or whatever, because it's rolling stones, not, not because it's a copy. They want to watch Manchester United play football because it's Manchester United, not some kind of copy. So it's the kind of this branding thing which kind of is linked to events which kind of we could expect we continue also into the future. Which of course also should perhaps tell us that events as a product line maybe should be more important in the future because it's kind of a way where you can at least to some extent maybe see easier profits than in traditional markets. You see my point? So, so this is important. On the other hand, of course, it should also tell you that logistics is perhaps not that important in events as it is in classical manufacturing. Because in classical manufacturing, these competitive forces kind of drives you into dealing good with your logistics, but that's not, perhaps not so important when it comes to events. Because as long as you have your brand, you have your local monopoly, you can kind of do what you like. Manchester United can sell their kind of t-shirts for I don't know what it sells for. Have anybody been there and bought one? It's kind of expensive, isn't it? Mm -hmm. An original Manchester United jersey shirt bought in at Old Trafford costs a lot of money. Maybe a thousand original. Costs. Of course, a copy could be easily manufactured. And it is easily manufactured, many places. But still, there is a market for those who want the original. Okay. As opposed to a kind of well-crafted and well-made copy of an iPhone, who would care? as long as it's, it's, it's legal. So there is some important differences here when it comes to kind of looking into the future on how events may develop as opposed to traditional manufacturing products. Of course, the same kind of be in this other segment that we, we talked about. And this, this final line here, of course, was the link to the product function from microeconomics as you kind of talked about, as kind of logistics as, as a way of kind of expanding the microeconomic production function. I'm looking at it in more detail. That is kind of one way of looking at logistics. Uh, we discussed this as well, didn't we? That logistics is kind of 
kind of arises when you made a lot of decisions already. You're deciding on what kind of design your product should have, what kind of price it should have, what kind of marketing you should put into it. And when all these kind of things are decided, then the demand profile kind of gets up, doesn't it? it kind of these decisions decides who will buy it, how many will buy it, and when they will buy it. And, in, and, and then at that point, logistics stops, okay? Because then you have to decide on how you should produce it, how much should you store, what kind of transportation means do you need, and all that kind of stuff. Okay? To kind of build the gap between the defined product and the customer. This is, oh, okay. This is typically at an operational level, okay? In most cases, it kind of runs in a relatively short time. These other decisions on pricing and marketing is kind of running on, on longer decisions, especially design functions, kind of could last for many years. Again, Apple is, of course, a convenient, a convenient example. You've probably seen the Apple computers. They don't look very much different today than they did. I don't know when they started with these uh, aluminum cases. You have a Mac, don't you, Erika? Mm -hmm. No, you have one. Yes. It's kind of, it's been for the last five years, at least, maybe even more. I think, yeah, maybe 10 years. It's, it's kind of a long, steady design. The same with the iPhones, they kind of, very small changes, same structure. So these design decisions are, of course, important. In the car industry, of course, we see it slightly different, but still there is very strong, kind of continuing design elements, keeping the brand, okay? Especially on the front of the cars, where they put there, it's kind of the same. Today, as it was maybe 50 years ago, Mercedes, they had the same logo and all this kind of stuff. They had the same grid. So you, you should kind of be able to spot the product. Like in the same way that you should be able to listen to Rolling Stones, say, okay, this is Rolling Stones. This is not big, it's okay. Uh, a few words on logistics research. We also talked a little bit about this. It says here that it's uh, mainly related to optimization. It's... Uh, related to a concept called complexity, which you probably don't know what is, but the complexity is easily said to be related to how fast can an algorithm perform. And then we can say certain algorithms, we can guarantee that they kind of follow a certain mathematical pattern, let's say like some kind of function, okay, it's like an exponential function, but that's very bad because then it increases very fast when size increases. So that's a kind of a bad situation. A good situation is if it's polynomial, as we say, then you kind of, you can restrict it to another set of functions when it comes to behavior. So these kind of topics are, are very strong in logistics research. Speed ups, the ability to kind of produce another algorithm which is faster than previous algorithms, that is of course an essential point here. And of course, finally, these kind of convergent proofs. You should be able to prove mathematically that a certain algorithmic construction actually ends up there you would like it to. Typically, either at the optimal value or at some kind of situation where it kind of gradually improves the value you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And then you need some kind of mathematical tools to kind of show that it, these can be done without kind of running all kind of cases on the computer. So this is kind of the essence of logistics research at least in the quantitative level. And this is very heavy mathematical theory. Especially these convergent proofs and this speed up and complexity kind of thing is very difficult stuff. So it, you could say perhaps that logistics research is very far from actual logistics. And I think that's true. And you can ask, is this good or bad? Some would say it's bad. Some would say it's good. And some would perhaps say it has to be like that. Because if you should make something Researchers, they kind of like, like challenges, don't they? And you need something to be challenging to kind of involve in research. And if, you, if it's easy, then you don't need to do research, because then everybody can do it. It's like if students ask me, what kind of course should I take? And I say, you should take the one which is hardest for you. And he asks, why should I do that? Why shouldn't I kind of express my talents? No, I tell you, you should spend your time learning what's difficult. Then you learn. It's the point of learning something. It's easy, you can do it yourself. So always kind of go for what's challenging, because then you, that, that will, either, you, of course, you can fail, on the other hand, you can learn something. So there is some kind of gap here between, should you say, the research side and the practical side, but that's how it always is. All kind of research is very different, di different from reality. If you look at language research, for instance, 
I don't know what you know anything about in, in linguistics. Do you do, do you, what they do? These guys who work, females who work in language research. Of course, they kind of look about how the language is built. How many sentences does it have? What kind of sounds do you use? And then they kind of start counting different sounds. They compare languages. All this kind of stuff. Because it's very far from writing books. Okay. So, so this is very typical. So you should kind of not be. You should actually expect that there's a kind of big difference between the research part of almost any area and and reality. Of course, the the topic where the difference is smallest is perhaps medicine. It was kind of close. Right? You are able to produce new drugs is very fast taken into use normally at least as long as it's as it's as it's safe. But this was just a kind of kind of introducing stuff. Here, uh, here are two definitions. Let us look at the first one. It's on manufacturing. It says manufacturing includes all steps necessary to convert raw materials, components, or parts. Do you know the difference on these three words? Raw materials, components, or parts? A raw material is something which is kind of done very little with, like uh, raw oil, or steel, or aluminium. A component is something which is kind of taken one step further. Okay? A component could be... In this one, there is some components. There is some transistors, there is some diodes, various kind of electronic components. The next step, when you, when you put several components together into a part, okay, then it could be an engine, for instance. Or, yeah. Okay, you see the point? Just kind of moving in, in, in up to kind of partitioning the, the finished product into several parts. Into finished goods, a finished goods uh, is perhaps something that somebody wants to buy. Of course, this is a uh, not a very good definition because people are interested in buying both raw material parts and components as well. So, so self-contracting is kind of what all these runs. But the finished goods, you could say, is something which kind of the end user would like to buy, the consumer, okay, the person who's not interested in the part of the component but actually the product and how it, how it should work. That meets a customer's expectations or specifications. Yeah. Manufacturing commonly employs a machine, a man-machine setup with division of labor in a large-scale production. Okay, so a man-machine setup is a situation where you do not use only people in your production. There is also some kind of machines there. It could be robots, it could be whatever. Okay. You've probably seen some pictures from a factory, haven't you? Maybe some of you have worked in some factories. Do we have any factory workers here? Nobody? Never? Okay. I have never worked in a factory either. So. Why shouldn't I? With division of labor, meaning in the sense that there are different, different types of labor here, kind of are needed to make this work. And in a large scale production, what do you mean by large scale production? simple. You produce many units. Okay. You don't produce one. You produce tens or hundreds or thousands or millions. Okay. You know how many MacBook Pros uh, Apple produces per year? No. No, I don't know either. I was <laughs> <laughs> so if you were to, to guess them, how, what would you think? Mm. Now let's look at Norway. Okay? I can tell you that. Uh, let's say Mac has 10% of the world market. Okay, and let's say that to make it easy, almost everybody is MacBook Pros. Okay, of course there is some other computers in the air, and there is some mini and so, but that's so small. So okay, let's make it easy. So 10% of all computers sold in Norway are MacBook Pros. How many computers are sold in Norway you per year? One every tenth Norwegian. Yeah, maybe. Let's say that. Okay. Then there's 500,000 sold in Norway. What share of Norway is the word? Yeah, of course, there's not so many MacBook Pros sold in, in poor countries because they can't, simply can't afford it. So we can kind of count the whole word here, but let's say the, the rich world. And how many people are living in the rich world? What is the rich world? China is a part of the rich world. That's one billion. Okay. And then we have the, the Russia, that's 300. United States, 400. 
India, can you you can buy MacBook Pros in India, can't you these days? Yes. Uh, maybe not everybody. Not everybody. But uh, some. Yeah. Say twenty percent. I mean, we suddenly get into two or three billions. Yeah. No, it's five millions. So we can. There is a fair amount, isn't it? Not very few. Actually, it's many millions of MacBook yeah. Pros sold every year. I would expect this was just an argument. I don't know. We can go into the internet and check. Okay, in classical logistics, we tend to, 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 to device between services and manufacturing. So what is services? You probably know, won't you? But let's le read the definition. Intangible products that are not goods. Tangible products. So goods are often referred to as tangible products, while intangibles are services. It's something you can't hold. You can't put it in your pocket. You can maybe see it through your eyes if you watch a film, okay? That would be a service. Mm -hmm. Such as accounting, banking, cleaning, consultancy, education, insur insurance, know-how, medical treatments, transportation. Are we missing something here? Events. Yeah, what about events? Should they be there? Yes. Yes. You think so? So events, they do not include manufactured products. They do. They do. But not the event. Not the event itself. I'm not so sure. Suppose you think about the painting exhibition. Mm. Depends on the event. Then. So I paint some pictures. Is that an event? Is that entertainment? I don't know. Maybe for something. But I, I would perhaps maybe put entertainment in at least. Maybe not events. We will talk more about this later. Mm. Sometimes services are difficult to identify because they are closely associated with a good, okay? That is kind of what we're talking about here. If you go to the doctor, then he asks you, how are you today? And you say, oh, I have a pain. Okay, so, okay, you have this disease, I have to give you some drugs, okay? And these drugs are, of course, manufactured goods. So there is, in many cases, combinations here. There's links between manufactured goods and services or events. Like if you go to a concert, you can buy some records, uh, you know, you know the drill, don't you? Yeah. Um, yeah. No transfer of possession or ownership takes place when services are sold. It says. So an event is perhaps not the pure service. Then. It's maybe something in between, in a sense. It's uh, it's kind of it resembles the services in many in many in many dimensions, but it's not perhaps completely a service because this transfership of of, of uh, ownership is something which is associated with many events. Uh, typically buying records, for instance, or buying paintings, or... Uh, in the theater, perhaps not so much. You could buy, buy books, but that's not so normal. Is it? I don't know. In your countries, if that's normal, if you go to, to a theater, is there any books you can buy which kind of describes the theater? You're watching the actual text? No, that's, that's very, fairly uncommon. Cannot be stored or transported, that kind of fits with the events as we think about it, doesn't it? Are instantly perishable. What does that mean? You know, food. Food perishes after a certain amount of time, then you can't eat it. But an event kind of is dead just after the event. So if you go to a match here, and it starts at six, and you meet up at eight o'clock. Then it's then it's dead. You can't <laughs> you can't see it, can you? Of course, you may see it on TV afterwards, but the match is gone. Okay, so it's instantly perished. And three come into existence at the time they are bought and consumed. That's typical for an event, isn't it? It kind of happens at some point in time, typically at some point in place. So we're kind of closing up on some event understanding here, that's the idea. So in a sense it seems reasonable to categorize events more in services than in manufacturing. Okay, we can agree on that, can't we? That, that seems reasonable. They're kind of more resembling services than manufactured goods. Still the painting sales exhibition example, as I kind of referred to. In, in that case, of course, the event itself is kind of based on Transfership or transferring ownership, isn't it? I'm going to sell these paintings to somebody who buys money for it. 
If you look at the business dictionary again, of course, these other definitions was from that text as well. It says it has a definition of events. Let's look at it. It says occurrence happening at a determinable time and place, with or without the particip participation of human agents. Can you think of any events where there are no human agents? Events like, say, the solar eclipse. What did you say? Solar eclipse. Like yeah, that's an event, but it's uh, it's not uh, made so much more known. Uh, but it, of course, you're an event. It's a kind of physical event. Yeah. Nature could produce events for us, which are don't need any human interaction. But of course, the events that interest us are those where there are human interaction. Okay, that's uh, kind of the events which are interesting because we cannot administer these. Of course, we can send people to watch the solar eclipse or the earthquake or whatever, volcano eruption. And some people do that. But uh, that's not the kind of events that we normally think about when we kind of think about this course. Very good job. It may be a part of a chain of occurrences as an effect of a preceding occurrence and as the cause of a succeeding occurrence. So there could be kind of events which are linked together in time. The Moldy International Jazz Festival is like this, kind of comes once every year. So there are some events which kind of pops up in some kind of regularity or even in regular times, but it kind of repeats, it kind of comes up again and again and again. But there are others which kind of are more like, should we say, one shot events. So the key point here, it's not so easy to see my nice. Uh, so what if I do this? Is it better then? No, not perfect. Maybe we should uh, take a curtains. Then I think it will be better. Now it's enough. That's okay. And we can put on the lights again. Ah. I want to use the board so much more. At least not yet. <coughs> so an event takes place at a predefined location. We need to know where it is, isn't it? That's uh, it must be defined. It doesn't. People need to know where it is, and it, of course it must be specified on time. And as I say, on the bottom here we, we kind of separate between at least I do it in the textbook here on one shot events and repeated events. Of course all these sports arrangements are in principle repeated, but if you think about an Olympic game, of course it, uh, it is repeated, but the, the kind of uh, sequence is very long, isn't it? In Norway we, we had an Olympics in Oslo in 1952 and there was one in Lillehammer in 94. And it might be one in uh, Oslo in 2020. So the distance between here is so large that it kind of... And it's of course not in the same place either. It's in different places in Norway. So, um, so typically you wouldn't expect that, uh, that these Olympic Games kind of return, at least not in a reasonable time. So most events are repeated. Okay. So when the Rolling Stones makes a tour, you would expect them to make another tour next year or maybe two years or three years. Okay, so, but you cannot expect that they return to the place you saw them the last time. Okay, that, that's not given. This uh, tour management kind of thing could change dramatically from one tour to another. And it could in a sense be the idea that you would like to visit other places than you did the last time before. Uh, so we can think about, at least think about this as certain events which kind of happens just once. And planning those events are of course different than planning repeated events. Do you agree? That, that, that there must be a kind of major difference here. Because we, if, th if something really repeats, if it repeats every week or each year or every tenth year, of course then you have some information you can use when you plan the next one. 
at least you have more information than in a situation where it's kind of 50 or 100 years before something might happen, which kind of resembles this event. <coughs> so these one-shot events, as it says here, are obviously kind of harder to plan logistically than the repeated ones. You have some information, you have some knowledge now here in Maldon, what kind of and at the football stadium down there, how many people will come, what kind of preferences do they have. Of course, when it comes to football, you, there is very easy because you would like the home team to win with as many goals as possible, so that's kind of easy. It's a bit harder on the Jazz Festival. Okay? You, uh, when you lead it, you would like to introduce some new and very fresh artists. On the other hand, you know that by doing that, you take a risk because some of the audience would be kind of reluctant to take the chance on some artists they do not know who are. Okay? In the old days, when there were very little events in Norway, uh, the amount was very limited. The kind of only event was the Mold the Jazz Festival, and then you, could, then you could actually stage anything. Everybody would like to see everything. They, they were kind of starving on this kind of old culture. But uh, these days it's kind of changed dramatically. Because, of course, maybe due to the internet and YouTube and everything, you can kind of see everything on forehand. So there is no artist now actually performing Today, where, 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 where a potential audience hasn't seen him before, okay? he's, <laughs> he's, he has made some kind of promotional material, it's always in YouTube, so you can always check up on an artist before you actually watch him or her live. In the old days, you, there was much more kind of risk-taking here, behavior. On the other hand, it was much more audience than artists in a way, so it was uh, kind of easier to pick out the kind of risk-taking audience. MJF is small the jazz festival, I think. MFK is small the football club. Just to give you the abbreviations, unless in, in, in case you didn't. So we kind of stick a little bit to the local events here, okay? We will talk a little bit about the local theater, about the jazz festival and about the football team. You probably know that uh, up north there is some other events. There is an opera in Kristiansund, as you probably know. There is a kind of photographic festival, have you heard about that? It's called Nordic Light. Yeah, so they have this kind of, should we say, more... Yeah, more fine culture, perhaps? I don't know whether that is an English word, but it's kind of more in the traditional sense. So there is some relatively big events actually in this area and this is because one of the reasons why we kind of started this program here we had to kind of have some infrastructure here which kind of under builds going for these kind of uh, these kind of uh, these kind of topics uh, when I taught this course last time two years ago then we spent a lot of time discussing with these partners they were kind of coming into the lecture discussing. I have chosen not to this time. Uh, partly because you have this course, which I know, which is called, what's it called, Applied Event Management or something, where you kind of meet these guys anyway. So, uh, so I've kind of been a little bit more reluctant. It's, it's kind of logistically complicated, it's just to make things work and get. But uh, if you get some spare time, maybe we can invite some people to talk about their events and tell you about the kind of challenges they meet. <laughs> okay, so what is, or what could event logistics be? It should not be too hard to accept that event logistics should handle logistics planning and the special challenges events impose. Okay, that, that seems to be the point here, that there must be some kind of differences between events and manufacturing or even service logistics to kind of make it sensible to have, to kind of specialize in looking at, uh, at logistics as such for these topics. And then I would like to emphasize here that the simple fact that events takes place at possibly unpredictable points in space and time obviously imposes special problems in relation to classical logistics modeling because classical logistics modeling is very repeated and very structured and very short-sighted so to speak. You kind of you produce high numbers every day basically. Okay? And there is very little time in classical manufacturing and actually thinking about making new products, uh, of course you have to, 
that you cannot do it outside your, the normal business. So there's a certain part of the business you produce is as fast as possible and as, with as high quality as possible. And there's other parts you kind of deal with kind of long-term planning. But when you do events, there is always time in between, okay? At least in most cases. The Jazz Festival is every year. The football team, they play a home match every 14th day. So at least there is a 14th day horizon where you can do planning up until the next match. So you have much more time basically when you deal with events than you deal with classical manufacturing. And this is important because it opens up both for benefits as well as problems. The main problem, if of course, with having horizons which are long is that the information you have is much less. You have less information on how much you sold and so on, as opposed to this situation where you kind of sell stuff continuously everywhere over the world. And it's limited typically to a, to a given location. You know how jazz audience behave in Molde. But if somebody at the Molde Jazz Festival say, oh, maybe we should move our festival to Paris, then you have no idea, do you? Now, you maybe know something that there is a certain amount of jazz festivals in Paris, you should perhaps avoid those time locations. But you don't know how the, the audience are, what kind of preferences they have, both to music and services and everything. Okay. So there are both positive parts by doing event planning, because there is more time. And there are negative time parts, because there is less information. So it says here there is lack of historical data when it comes to forecasting. We have very much limited amounts of data. Of course, that makes forecasting harder. And of course, if there's very long time in between events, the world could change. Okay? The world will always change, of course. And when you do events, it, you're very focused on the audience preferences. What do they like? What do they dislike? You try to hit the right artist or the right play, the right opera singer, the right film, whatever. And that, that, that could be very hard, especially if there's a kind of time distance in between here. Because what was popular yesterday may not be popular tomorrow. The fact that you cannot store events has impacts, of course. In general, it should mean that it's easier to run events, because you don't need to care about storing the event itself. The final product doesn't need to be stored, so you don't need to make those decisions. You don't need to decide on how much should I store, and leave for next year. Of course, you can think storage if you think about the Jazz Festival. Like you say, okay, I would like to have Jan Garbarek playing on Molde International Jazz Festival. For some queer reason, he hasn't played here for 20 years. I don't know why. He's, of course, the most famous Norwegian jazz musician playing saxophone. I don't. Have you heard him? You have never heard Jan Garbarek, none of you? What kind of music do you like? Do you like music? At all? Maybe you like, maybe like Indian music, you like uh, African music, you like Chinese, you like salsa perhaps. Yeah. yeah. You know what salsa is? Yeah. Erika, do you know what salsa music? You know that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But Erika, you don't know, you haven't heard Jan Garbarek ever. You've heard about him, haven't you? No. You haven't heard about Jan Garbarek? Huh. I'm surprised, I must. Uh, <laughs> We have, to, we have to ask Google here, I think. Uh, this was really surprising, I must say. Yeah, here uh, you can see some pictures of him. He's an old man, you can see. But he's actually very famous. Uh, let's see what they say. Uh, for born 1947, yeah, so what, how old was he then? He's 60, 66, yeah. This is Norwegian, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Here you can see some of the musicians he have, he have been cooperating with. Have you heard about Chick Corea then? No. Ah, Keith Jarrett. You, heard, you must have heard about Keith Jarrett. You heard about Keith Jarrett, Joe. Okay, that's good. At least one name was fam fam familiar here. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
So I, I should perhaps uh, do not use too many jazz examples. I think that's, uh, that might be bad, it would be hard to. So what, what kind of events are you interested in? Then? Paintings? Theatre? Why are you here? What, what kind of draws, drew, drew you to this course? Business events. Business events, you know, like congresses? Congress. That kind of stuff. Okay, but that's very boring, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sport events. It runs by itself. You just put some smart people together and give them some coffee and then you don't have to do anything else. <laughs> it's, it's very easy. Okay, okay. Uh, what time is it? Yeah, we should perhaps take a break. Yeah, we take a break. Now to the next time, go home, read about Young Albaric. Thank <laughs> you.